Okay, we're up to the 17. Okay. Um, welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, we have a few little reminders to start. Uh, first, please sign up for our Basecamp system if you haven't already, and feel free to share Basecamp invitations with your colleagues. Uh, this is where we post the webinars, the meeting notes, and other helpful materials and documents about telegenetics. Uh, if you haven't received an invitation to Basecamp or have any other questions, feel free to contact me or the NIMAC staff. Um, another reminder, as was posted in Basecamp and emailed to everyone, the Mid-Atlantic Telehealth Resource Center, MATRC, is one of the regional telehealth resource centers in the country funded by the federal government to facilitate telehealth programs. Their geographic region is similar to NIMAX, and we have been working together on a number of projects and collaborations. Right now, NIMAC funding is available for a limited number of attendees to the 2017 MATRC Research Symposium, which will include a pre-summit session on telegenetics. Uh, the symposium will take place April 2nd to April 4th uh, in Leesburg, Virginia. More information about the symposium can be found on the MATRC website. And funding is available for travel to and from Leesburg, uh, full meeting registration, two hotel nights, and a food allowance. Uh, there's a very brief application for funding available online. Uh, applicants will be notified by February 10th whether funding will be available for their attendance. Um, and you can direct any questions about this to me or to the NIMAC staff. Uh, looking ahead, the next webinar will be in either March or April on telehealth technology options. And some of the staff from MATRC will be sharing this information with us. So we do look forward to that upcoming collaboration. But today, we're going to be talking about billing and reimbursement for telegenetic services. We all know how vital this is to program success. Our speaker today is telegenetics expert Dr. David Flannery. Dr. Flannery is the medical director of the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics. Prior to joining ACMG in 2014, he practiced at the Medical College of Georgia, where he served in a variety of clinical, academic, and medical staff leadership positions since 1984 including Professor of Pediatrics, Chief of the Genetics Division, Vice Chair for Administration, Medical Director for Pediatric Ambulatory Care, President of the Medical Staff, Board of Directors of the MCG Health System, and Chair of the Board of Trustees of the Physician Practice Group. He established telemedicine genetics clinical services to multiple sites in rural Georgia beginning in 1995 and has been a leader in the practice of and education about telemedicine and telegenetics since. Um, as usual, we do encourage people to share their experiences and ask questions to Dr. Flannery and other members of the group. We do ask you to type comments into the t uh, comment box uh, to do so, since the audience will be on mute. Um, and just before we get started, we thought it would be useful for our purposes and even for Dr. Flannery to have an uh, understanding of where everyone is with regard to this. So we do have a um, question, poll question for all of you. That's going to come up on the screen in just a second. Okay. So our question is, do you have a billing or reimbursement structure in place for your telegenetic services? So we ask you to uh, respond to this question for us, and we'll be able to sort of see where the audience is at. Okay, so it does look like we have a lot of people that don't really have their plan in place yet, which is um, probably good because Dr. Flannery has a lot to share with us about uh, where we should begin our thought process and our planning process. So um, that's useful information to know. So thanks everybody for that. So with that, um, we thank Dr. Flannery for being here with us and we look forward to talking with him and he's going to take it from here. Very good. Thank you for having me give this talk. Uh, I get very enthused about talking about telemedicine. My wife points this out to me whenever I start talking at a party or something. 
I'm going to talk about something beyond simply billing and reimbursement. I'm talking about considerations in the business planning for telegenetic services. Uh, next slide is my disclaimer. I mean, my disclosure. I need to let you know that I'm on the board of directors of Salus Telehealth, which is a S Corp, whatever that is, a startup telehealth company, which originated as a spinoff from the Global Partnership for Telehealth, which is in Georgia, where I have been. Um, next slide. My disclaimers here are that these are considerations are my own thoughts on these issues, not ACMG or the NCC. And uh, you know, following these considerations doesn't guarantee that you'll be financially successful. There are many factors that go into that. And it's very important for you to check with your compliance office, your risk managers, and legal advisors regarding regulatory and contracting issues that we'll be discussing here. Next slide. So sort of go through this whole process, the thought process and the planning process. So the first thing you need to do is make sure telemedicine is recognized by your state medical board as an accepted part of the practice of medicine. Most states it is, but assume nothing. Be sure to check. Uh, some states have some limitations, uh, such as requiring that the provider already has an established relationship with the patient before you can do telemedicine. Uh, in some instances, the relationship has to be an in-person encounter with the patient before you do a telemedicine visit. Uh, it would certainly become a non-starter for uh, the whole point that we want to do telegenetics. Next slide. Licensure is an issue. Uh, physicians have to be licensed in a state where the patient will be seen, which is called the originating site, as well as in the state where the physician is conducting the encounter, which is called the distant site. Uh, it can be expensive if they want to provide telemedicine services to several states because you're going to have to have licenses that you pay for uh, on a regular basis and renew. You've all heard about the Interstate Licensing Compact. This is a process that's going to make it easier to obtain a medical license in another state, but it's not going to make a universal uh, countrywide licensing process. You'll still have to apply to each state that you want to license in. It will be less difficult and less time consuming, but you still will have to be paying for licensure. Uh, also, it's important regarding licensure to check state licensing laws regarding genetic counselors. It's likely, in my opinion, that the genetic counselor would also need to be licensed in the originating site and in the distant site, but I can't be sure of that. I couldn't get an answer uh, to that question. Uh, so I would think that you would check with your state licensing uh, board to check on those today. Next slide. Now, liability insurance. You want to check with your malpractice insurer to be sure they cover telemedicine as part of your malpractice. And if they don't, find another insurer. Check it until you can find that. Um, the American Telemedicine Association on its website has resources where you can find out about uh, insurance uh, if your liability insurer doesn't cover telemedicine. Next slide. Credentialing is an important part if you're doing this from a hospital-based clinic or from a hospital or to a hospital-based uh, clinic. And you're going to have to go through the process of joint commission. And it can be complicated, especially if it's this originating site that hasn't done telemedicine before. They're going to have to create a process for credentialing providers for telemedicine. And then they'd have to go ahead and create the privileging forms, and then a credentialing process. Uh, the paperwork would be time consuming, and the process has many steps in it. And typically, getting uh, credentials at a hospital can take up to 180 days. So just be aware of that. Interestingly, the Joint Commission allows facilities to use deemed credentialing. In other words, if you were credentialed at your hospital to do telemedicine, the Joint Commission would allow a hospital that wants to have telemedicine with you simply accept your credentials from your hospital. Uh, but in my experience, uh, not all hospitals follow this. Uh, in Georgia, we had uh, that, this issue with uh, a number of hospitals where I got privileges to do telemedicine. Next slide. Um, I'm not aware of any payer that requires a provider to be credentialed with them for telemedicine. 
but uh, you never know if you want to check with payers. And when you're checking with payers, also make sure whether you're an in-network provider or not, because this can influence uh, your business model. Because if patients can only see you as an out-of-network provider, their out-of-pocket expenses are going to be significantly more, and it may be an impediment to uh, providing telegenic services. Next slide. Now, this is really important. You want to find out who the main payers are in the area that you're considering providing telemedicine uh, services to. And I, once you identify them, determine if telemedicine is a covered service, which is the first step. Just because it's covered doesn't mean you get paid much, so you've got to then check what the payment is. And ideally, it should be reimbursed at the same rate as the service provided in person. And this is, uh, in many states, called a parity law which requires the payment for telemedicine to be the same as in person, but not all states have parity laws, so you need to check. You also want to check with the payers to see if they recognize your counselors as providers and make sure they reimburse the 96040 CPT code. It's also good to determine if the payer reimburses the originating site to any extent uh, because that can be an important part of participating in the telemedicine pro program. Next slide. Uh, some additional payer considerations. If you're seeing Medicare patients, there are currently geographic limitations on where patients can be seen by telemedicine. That is the originating site. And uh, Medicare does provide a nominal reimbursement to the originating site in addition uh, to paying the provider of the telemedicine service. Uh, be aware that Medicaid programs are state specific. So you have to check with Medicaid in the originating site and in your site to make sure telemedicine is covered and make sure it's paid for and how much they reimburse for that. Next slide. So there's several models for a business model for doing a telegenetic service. The most common one is going to be fee for service. So I wanted to talk through business processes involved in this, not simply billing processes. Next slide. So we talked about front-end processes in this. And so a front-end process here, you want to check to make sure that, see if the payer for your patient who's been referred requires a referral and prior authorization for a telemedicine visit. You need to figure out who handles referral and prior authorization process. Is it going to be your office, or is it going to be the, the originating site that's going to be responsible for that? Uh, personally, if you are going to be providing tele genetic services to multiple sites, it might be best to have the originating sites do that for you, since they're the people who would be getting the patient referral. And you also need to make sure who's going to schedule the patient. You know, is it the, dis the originating site who's going to do that? If they do, how do they get it into your schedule so that you have that information? And then, of course, uh, when the patient shows up at the originating site, you want to confirm that they are still covered by the payer that you were told. So you, usually you check their insurance card and you copy it. You correct the demographic information in your registration system because information may have changed. And if you have incorrect insurance information or incorrect demographic information, you're going to have denials of your bills. You want to make sure there's a process for that information to be transferred to your billing system so that you have that information captured in your system. Um, at the originating site, you also want to make sure that the uh, patient or parent has signed consent for treatment for telemedicine. So you need to have developed forms for this so that they are then signing for that. There typically are forms when patients come to your clinic or your office that they sign, uh, but this is going to be beyond that to include that they're consenting for telemedicine. Next slide. Sort of middle processes here. This is what you really want to know about, right? Billing and coding. So the way you bill is using a CPT code plus an ICD code. We now have ICD-10 is what we're using. So when you use the CPT code, you can typically use an E&M code and add a GT modifier to it. That indicates that it's a telemedicine visit. Not all payers recognize GT. That's one thing you 
need to clarify with them in advance when you're finding out about payers and their coverage. They may want a different modifier or they may not care. Now, Medicare doesn't pay for CP consultation CPT codes. They stopped doing that a number of years ago. And that's for any visit. That's a, for an in-person visit or for telemedicine. So what you would do when you build Medicare is use the appropriate office visit CPT code for that encounter and then add the GT modifier. Now, Medicare pays the originating site if it submits a bill and there's a HCPCS code and it's for their Q3014. And if it's properly uh, submitted, uh, my understanding is that they pay somewhere in the neighborhood of $25 to $35 to the originating site. You need to check with other payers, especially Medicaid, to make sure whether they have a unique code for telemedicine services or not. And to uh, make sure that you submit the right code that the payer wants. Now, if a genetic counselor is providing the service and billing, you just use the 96040 code just as you would for an in-person counseling session. But you want to make sure that you've already established with the payer that genetic counseling is a covered service and that they pay for the 96040 code. Next slide. Okay, back end processes. So you've seen the patient. Uh, you document the visit in a note. Uh, in your planning process, you should have established which medical record is the official record for the patient. Um, in some instances, it might be the originating site. They want their record to be the official record, so you would document in that record, which would then require you have access to their EHR system. You would certainly send copies to the referring physician and to other record systems as determined to be appropriate. Uh, for example, if your EHR is not the official record, you would still want to make sure that you send a copy of the encounter uh, to your record system so that you have that, especially when you have issue of billing questions. Uh, something you have to think about, especially with people who have private insurance, is collecting the patient responsibility portion of your charge. So you have to have that worked out at the originating site for them to be able to collect that and pass it on to your uh, billing office. Next slide. Uh, other back-end processes, this is like just good business practice. You need to track revenue cycle metrics for the telemedicine service itself. So in other words, be able to identify the patients who you've seen by telemedicine and track things like their, oops, okay, I've lost my, my video here. Has something happened? Mine, mine is still on, Dr. Flannery. Is anyone else having a problem with their video? Okay, well, this is weird. The usual problem we have around here with Skype for Business is our um, phone system, but something's happened to my computer system here for some reason. I'm having to log back in. Okay. So you can track things like the total charges that you've uh, submitted for telemedicine services. You want to see how much you've actually collected. You want to look at what's called the net collection rate. So the net collection rate is you take the information that you know from payers, what they say they're going to pay, and then you see how much you actually got paid. The net collection rate should be close to 95% if you're doing business correctly. If your net collection rate is not that good, you have to drill into it and discover what's the problem, why you're not getting those collections. Um, similarly, you look at denials. If a bill is denied, you Look and see why that was and see what part of your business process you need to work on to improve that. You also want to look at days and accounts receivable and other metrics that are typical for a practice to look at their business and how it's running. Um, if your days and accounts receivable become, you know, very long, uh, there may be a payer who's creating a problem for you and you've got to go figure out what's wrong with that and why you're not getting uh, paid in, in a timely fashion. Also, it's good to track the patient no-show rate. 
You want to see if it's site specific, if there's a deep poor no sh poor show rate. You want to see if it's referrer specific. In other words, the referring physician may not have made things clear to the patient, you know, about telemedicine and you know how to access it and where to go and those sorts of things. This is all just good business practice. Next slide. So another model is contracted services. So next slide. So in this model, you can have similar considerations uh, as the fee for service regarding licensure, credentialing, referral processes, those kind of things. Uh, but what's going on with contracted services here is that there is a site that wants to have telegenetic services, and so you work out a contract for your providers to provide those services. So the important part is first determining who the appropriate people are to negotiate the contract and which entities are involved in the contract. I mean, it could be the hospital. It could be a physician practice group. Clearly, you need to consult with uh, legal uh, advisors regarding this. You want to clarify and specify exactly what services are being contracted for. And it may seem like, oh, well, if a genetics clinic, you know, determine what exactly they think the patients are going to receive from you and determine if that's something you can deliver. And then a more complex part is going to be determining what's the appropriate payment for service. Um, should, would it be per patient encountered, or should it be per clinic session that you've scheduled and you log into, and if there's a 25% no-show rate, you still get paid the same amount as if everybody showed up. You, know, you give those things careful thought. If it's going to be a low-volume site, you certainly would like to try to get a paid per clinic session and try to determine what the originating site sees as the value of this access as opposed to, you know, you billing, you know, three office visit codes at a mid-level uh, and collecting maybe $150 for the session, which might not, uh, you know, make it uh, economically viable. And that gets then to the last bullet there about tracking the revenue to determine if the contract is financially viable. In other words, is it worth your time that, or your provider's time that is being spent in this uh, session. Next slide. There's also now a direct consumer telemedicine. Um, for some reason it's called B2C for business to consumer and it's really direct to consumer telemedicine. Uh, next slide. So the similar consideration we talked about before about licensure, all those sorts of things where the patient is located, all that kind of stuff. But typically, B2C platforms um, bill patients directly. So patients have to register with the B2C company. And um, they don't deal with insurance companies. They just bill the patients and give them like a credit card number or something. And the, when the encounter happens, the B2C company bills the credit card and takes the money. Uh, the B2C companies take a portion of the fee for themselves before passing on the dollars to the provider, and that's usually a contracted agreement between the uh, B2C company and the provider. Uh, the contract is between the provider or provider's organization and the B2C company, so of course, once again, you need to check with legal advisors. Um, you need to be certain if you're going to do a B2C type model uh, in terms of, you know, make sure they have uh, HIPAA compliant uh, platforms and all those important things that are necessary. <clears throat> Interestingly, many health systems already have a B2C telemedicine uh, portal. Uh, it's typically for acute care visits. They promote it uh, typically on the front page of their uh, web page. And it could be useful to you if you want to think about it to check your health system and see if they actually have a B2C uh, contract already that you could then simply become part of. That way you've got the hospitals already doing the marketing. It's just a matter of that, and they would probably find it be um, valuable to them to have more service being provided because they are paying the B2C company, you know, a 
pretty hefty monthly fee for this. Next slide. Now, store and forward telemedicine for genetics could be done. The whole concept here is you have a secure way to capture uh, documents, images of the patient, you know, video of the patient, the x-rays, those sorts of things, and then they are securely transmitted. And then in the system that you could use, they would then have a way for you to open this up asynchronously, review the material, render an opinion, give advice, document it, and send it back to the referring uh, provider. Next slide. You know, you could really do this, you know, for dysmorphology for sure. And it's, you know, already happens informally, as uh, we all know. Um, but you need to make sure that it's structured in a way to meet a definition of the practice of medicine that your state medical board recognizes. Um, because, you know, if it just looks like email, they probably might not consider that using email is necessarily practicing medicine. So you would need to check with them about that. Uh, there are platforms for this. Uh, there are numerous uh, programs and companies that have this kind of service, and you can find them either by searching the internet or contacting a uh, regional telehealth uh, resource center. And then you need to figure out how you're going to bill for this. You know, how you bill the provider, or you can bill the patient. <coughs> Next slide. Now, future business models are value-based payment, so-called bundled payment model. And this is the thing where um, there's going to be a single payment for a patient episode of care, and we have to start thinking now about how you're going to document genetic genetics added value to the the patient's uh, episode of care, and figure out how you're going to divide up the payments. Um, this is going to keep going on, even though there may be some changes at HHS, uh, CMS. Uh, but uh, the trend towards this is, is out there, and there are many payers that are working on this. Uh, so it's something for us to be thinking about, of how we can plan for this future. Next slide. Now, this may seem obvious, but you know, you really think this through. You're going to need to plan how you're going to deliver this clinical service. You know, the whole concept is you want to make sure that the patient encounter is equivalent to the care they would have gotten in person. And you want to make sure it works smoothly because uh, with telemedicine, you know, you've got, I always say that the telemedicine room is the most valuable real estate. You maximize your use of the telemedicine room and try to make sure you only do things that have to be done in the telemedicine room in the telemedicine room. And that takes planning. And so you want to establish protocols or standard operating procedures that are then in place. You can train the clinical care team members who can be involved in telemedicine at the originating site as well as at uh, your distant site. And these are things like how you get the patient checked in and registered, what do you do vital signs, what vital signs, how they get transmitted to you. Uh, who accompanies the patient to the telemedicine room? You know, is there a presenter? What is their role in the interview and the choreography of the visit? You know, because typically you're going to use the interview cam, do the history, then you move the patient to a table and use an exam camera to do the exam. It would guide the uh, presenter to use the different um, peripherals that you may need in the exam. <clears throat> want to make sure they've been trained in doing that and how to transmit those images, you know, the choreography, getting the, the family and patient back into the interview cam area. And then, you know, you have your you know, discussion with them, talk about your assessment and your recommendations and your plans, and how you're going to transmit lab order forms, prescriptions, how you also how the patient checks out uh, so that you've got them, you know, getting collected in their uh, patient uh, responsibility portion, for example. You need to do the same kind of protocol for genetic counseling only telemedicine visits, because I'm sure that that's one of the 
great opportunities for using telemedicine. You want to make sure you know who needs to be doing what at the uh, originating site, how that will be conducted. And you know you probably should consider establishing standards for the content of frequent types of genetic and, and counseling telemedicine encounters so that you have consistency in the service you provide. You know, for example, you know, if you want to make sure that every patient who comes in for you know family history of breast cancer, you make sure what all the points are that you're going to make in the assessment and the counseling to make sure that it's consistent from visit to visit. Next slide. You need to plan how you're going to market this service because you know you don't just uh, you know build it and they come. You have to figure out how you're going to market this availability. Um, you know how you're going to get referrals, referring providers to make referrals. Um, it, probably will involve going in person to meet people. Um, you know, if it's going to be a site that is like a hospital-based site and uh, you're going to be hopefully dealing with multiple physicians, it might be good to attend a medical staff, you know, monthly meeting and uh, actually do a demo for them and uh, explain to them what your referral process is going to be and what your commitment is to providing the service and those sorts of things. And then you have to uh, remind them that you can send mailings out to people, things of that sort as well. Next slide. You need to plan how you're going to assess the quality of the care delivered. Uh, Typically, you didn't get patient satisfaction. You probably already have that built in for your, uh, your regular genetic services. Figure out how you can get those satisfaction surveys sent to patients at originating sites. And also, it's important to have the geneticists and genetic counselors satisfaction with the encounter assessed after each encounter to see like whether the quality was as good as you hoped it could be. And if it was not, you know, figure out how you can make it better. It may be that you determine from that that there are certain types of patients that you really don't think will work well in a telemedicine encounter. So you put that into your referral process so you don't get those patients referred. Um, it may be that there were technological issues and then you have to work with your uh, IT people to figure out how you improve those. Uh, there could be problems with the originating site staff not understanding how you want things conducted, so it may require some more um, staff development uh, activities with them. And then it's really good to find out how the referring providers feel about the sort of service, you know, how satisfied they are about the access and the service their patients received. And um, typically that way you can end up getting, you know, providers who are champions, quote unquote, for telemedicine who can then be people who advocate with their uh, fellow practitioners in the community about uh, this great resource that's available. Uh, in terms of outcome measures, there really are no specific telemedicine, telegenetic outcome measures that have been developed yet. Um, interestingly, I'm on the National Quality Forum's telehealth uh, uh, work group or committee that is tasked with developing uh, outcome measures uh, for telemedicine. So uh, hopefully we'll have some that we can share. This is, it's going to be a 15 month process. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see uh, what comes out of this. Next slide. Ah, very good. Feel free to contact me for advice at my email, uh, but I also have left plenty of time for questions and I'm happy to take any questions that people have. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Fleming. Um, so as we've done in the past, you can type questions into the question box if you have them. Um, and I can start with a few questions as we wait for other people to enter some. Um, Dr. Flannery, you mentioned that some of the regulations that impact billing can differ from state to state, including the parity laws. Um, I was just wondering if you find one resource in particular to be the best um, for knowing sort of up to date about those state specific issues. I know the ATA sometimes has that, the regional telehealth resource centers have it. Is there one in particular you would look to? Um, 
you know, I would always recommend checking with your telehealth resource center and with ATA. But yes. it's also important to check with the payers who are going to be covering the patient's population where you want to offer the service because they may make their own individual uh, decisions about things. And if there is a parity law, you want to make sure that they actually are following it. Right. <laughs> they may be oblivious to the fact that there is a law. You never know. Uh, so you have to, yep. it's always like, um, you know, confirm things uh, before you go into the uh, providing the service. You, you want to have done all of your homework so you know that you can model what your revenue should potentially be for a particular service. And, you know, if it doesn't look like it's going to be something that is um, going to be viable, then you don't sink all your time and effort into doing it. Yep, definitely. All right. We've got a few questions. Um, someone did ask if copies of the slides are available, and the answer to that is yes. Uh, we do post those um, in Basecamp. Um, as well as the recorded webinar, so you will see um, those in Basecamp, and um, we, we send emails about that too. Um, if you need to get a hold of us, you can um, look on the NIMAC website if you don't have any of our emails. Um, so let us know if you're having trouble finding the copies of the slides. All right, the next question is, what is your experience with telemedicine and the metabolic registered di dietitian provider? <laughs> Good question. Um, my personal experience was that our uh, metabolic nutritionist involved in telemedicine was uh, giving the service away because there's not able to get uh, billed and collected. Um, but that had to do with, with the payer mix that, that we had. Um, that certainly could be a very valuable uh, service to provide, and you actually could develop outcome measures to show how your patients have been growing, what their nutritional status is, and their control before you implement telemedicine services. And then afterwards, um, if your state um, Medicaid, for example, doesn't uh, recognize nutritionists submitting charges for telemedicine, you could potentially you know, talk to them about, you know, identify the cadre of patients that you would be doing this with and say, how about doing a demonstration project and here are the outcomes, we look at the outcomes and see what, how their growth is, how their nutrition is, and how their control is after the telemedicine intervention. And uh, that may then lead to permanent coverage uh, for that. But as I mentioned, Medicaid is a state-by-state -state thing and I, you just have to check with Medicaid. Um, similarly, you would have to check with payers to see. Uh, Medicare reimburses uh, nutritionists uh, for certain diagnoses, but not for any important error that I'm aware of. Okay. I will say, add to that, that um, there are a lot of dietitians um, that participate in, the, in our Teletonex community of practice, so I know it's a huge area of interest. Um, for many of the reasons that Dr. Flannery just mentioned, including, you know, that those are the patients that often require the most um, consistent and frequent follow-up. Um, so I think it's a huge area of interest among a lot of people. Well, okay. actually, a mobile platform for that would allow you to actually do home visits virtually with right. the, uh, the family. Um, you could have a Bluetooth scale to wirelessly upload the child's weight. Um, you know, you could actually observe the uh, parent mixing the child's formula, so the nutritionist could say, well, okay, a teaspoon is actually a measuring teaspoon, not that silver thing you're using, that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. I, I see great, great possibility for that, for virtual home visits for that. Yep. Okay, the next question is, uh, my understanding is that genetic counselors don't require Joint commissions yet? Is that correct? Um, I don't know. I mean, it depends on your institution. If genetic counselors are considered part of the medical staff or they're just considered to be part of the staff of the hospital, uh, or they may be considered to be, you know, employed by the physician. Uh, so if you see in one model, you see in one model. Um, 
I know that uh, an SGC had some model language for medical staff um, positions for genetic counselors, uh, but I'm not. I don't know, if, you know, where that has gone. Uh, yeah, I don't know the answer to that either. I think. Um, you know, NSGC did used to have a telemedicine, telegenetics uh, special interest group. They do not right now. Um, I'm sure this is one of those things that they would have been able to address for us and answer. Um, they may have people that are still very uh, up to date on these sorts of issues that would be able to help. All right, let's see. Um, so I would just wanted to ask, in our NIMAC survey, we saw that about a third of the programs have um, these contract type relationships set up instead of the typical insurance reimbursement structures. I was just wondering if it's your experience that contracts are more common in telemedicine than in in-person clinical services. Um, I only have my personal experience and in Georgia we had a robust tele telemedicine network so um, it was Develop for fee for service. Uh, the, I'm not aware of any genetics program that's doing contracted, except for maybe uh, University of Arkansas Medical School. Uh, they believe they do have a contract uh, for providing services uh, across state lines, but I don't know the details of that. It'd be something we could certainly uh, ask uh, Brad Schaefer about. Yeah. All right, we have another question. Uh, how can you get an abdominal exam with telemedicine? You can't. <laughs> that's why there are certain patients you shouldn't see on telemedicine. That's, right. that's the only limitation. You know, you want the encounter to be equivalent to what would have happened uh, in, in person. And, yep. um, you know, an abdominal exam for some diagnoses is crucial. I actually had that happen to me where a child was sent to me because of a birthmark. When you saw the child, you know, the child had hemihypertrophy. And it's like, not going to do this on telemedicine because even though we, we could order an ultrasound and blood work on the child, you know, we couldn't palpate the abdomen that day. And, you know, if the kid already had a tumor and there was a delay, you know, it would just be uh, really poor medicine. So, you know, we said, like, this is not you know, quality uh, care and, you know, we're not going to be able to do this, here's why, and let's get you seen in person ASAP. Yeah. So it's a valid point. Until they develop the virtual uh, reality glove or something, um, right. you know, that limitation. Yeah. And we have seen some models um, where they have, for example, a pediatrician or somebody on the um, – at the originating site with the patient that does some of those types of things if, if they're going to be necessary. So it also, I think, depends what staff you have, whether it's clinical staff and, you know, what they can do, what their capabilities are in terms of what your limitations are with the exam. I would say you would need to check with your risk managers if you wanted to do that and have someone do part of your exam for you because I would think most risk managers would have some really significant concerns unless it was really, really spelled out legally. Just my opinion. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, so I just wanted to ask when, you know, when we did our survey, we actually saw that less than half of the existing telegenetics programs were billing insurance in any way. Um, I was wondering, what do you feel are the biggest obstacles for um, programs to actually start billing insurance? And um, does it surprise you that it was that low? Sure. Well, that was all, that's all due to all those front end processes you have to have in place in order to mm -hmm. create what I would call a billable event. And, you know, if you have originating sites that are at distance and getting them organized to do that for you and then get it to you so you get it to your billing system, it's crucial. And, you know, that should be part of your, you know, business model is sitting there and figure out you know, how many patients it would take, you know, per virtual clinic for it to be worth your while and then figure out, you know, how you would make certain that you could do all those front end processes to then be able to bill. But I'm sure that's the real real challenge is having those front end processes in place. Um, 
you know, we were fortunate in Georgia because there was centralized scheduling system and it collected all the data and then the EHRs in our billing system could just, you know, download that data directly from that. Um, but that's sort of nirvana. Um, but that's the key. Yep. Yep. Um, and then when you mentioned the direct-to-consumer programs, most of the ones that um, I have heard about in the NIMAC region are actually independent telegenetics businesses, so it's not necessarily a provider who's contracted with a telemedicine business that's running the programs, but it's actually an independent business where all they do is telegenetics. Um, so I was just wondering if you could share a little more with us about the other model that you described where there's some sort of telehealth company that a provider can then um, become contracted with to deliver the services. Mm -hmm. Any number of companies that do that, and if you look at uh, you know health systems that have those acute virtual visit things on their front page, uh, there are several large telemedicine companies that are the ones that actually organize that for the, uh, the health system and uh, provide the platform, and the health system provides the providers and markets it to get patients to contact you know log into the portal and register and that sort of thing. Um, so it's it's out there and there's any yeah. number of companies that uh, can do that. And you know certainly if people on the call have a health system that does have that, uh, the health system may not have thought about using it for other things besides those you know acute visits and uh, you could have a fruitful discussion with them potentially. Uh, but you'd have to go through a careful business planning process and figure out what types of patients. And as I mentioned, I talked about this at the Western states, and someone said, oh, God, all these people will be contacting me with their 23 and me results. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's like, that could happen. You know, you have to figure out if that's something you want to deal with or if you have a screening process of who's appropriate uh, to, to do this. Um, right. But it's, it's certainly something to think about. Yep. Um, I was wondering if you have any thoughts for the group about how to approach um, a contract type service in terms of thinking through or seeking assistance with figuring out how to set up the rate and the scope of work for these types of contracts. Right. Well, you know, you want to see who's responsible for what. You try to put all the scheduling and all that stuff. Uh, on the responsibility of the originating site, and that's part of the contract. So that if they don't do it, you say, "Hey, you're not delivering on this contract. You know, you're, we're out of here." Um, that would be the best model, in my opinion, um, because um, they are where the patient is or going to be, so they're closer. So they should be able to have access to that and they can call the patient if necessary. Um, the other thing certainly is you have to figure out if it's going to be a you know like a four hour session, for example. You have to figure out what four hours of your genetic provider's uh, time is worth, and then figure out then you know how you build that into the contract to have that reimbursed, and you know especially if it's going to be you know someplace that's not familiar with it, um, you want to make sure that if you can, that you're going to get paid for a session, not for individual patients, so that that should motivate the uh, uh, originating uh, facility to make sure they get patients signed up, checked in, you know, uh, attending the, the visit, because that's the only way they'll, you know, not lose money on the deal uh, in their eyes. Okay. And that certainly would make the most sense. Um, you know, if you're like so famous that people would be flocking to see you and you could set a rate per patient uh, to do that, uh, you probably could do better with the, you know, individual, you know, encounter-based uh, reimbursement. But I don't think there are that many programs that would be such a big draw for that. Um, right. So, that's just my personal opinion, but that's how I would do it. Um, mm -hmm. 
know, if you set up an outreach clinic in person, you know, you know, if you can, it's the same kind of thought process. You know, if you're going to drive three hours to do an outreach clinic, you know, how many patients do you need to see for it to be worth your time to spend six hours commuting and whatever time there in person? Right. Um, what is your understanding about whether or not insurance can be billed for patients who do receive services at home, like you described with the, the dietitian? We have got, gotten some discrepant feedback from people about where the patient has to be located when they receive the services. <laughs> Right. Um, you know, there are codes for home visits, um, CPT codes, and I guess you could then find out if they're covered or not would be the, the key thing. Um, you know, and then if there are for home visits, then you have to see if the payer feels that telemedicine is uh, an appropriate way for that to be done and that they would cover and reimburse it. Um, that's why, you know, it's the kind of thing that um, a demonstration project, you know, might be the, the way to go first, so that you develop the data to show the value. Mm -hmm. But you try to do that demonstration with other people's money, not your own, if, if possible, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, for someone approaching uh, launching a new program in a medical institution setting, can you share your thoughts on who are the important institution staff members to sort of bring into a meeting to discuss this type of business plan? Uh, depends on your institution. I mean, if it's going to be something that, you know, falls under your practice plan organization, you know, then you would do that. If it's going to be a hospital-based facility, you have to then get, um, you know, hospital people involved. This can typically be uh, operations people as well as finance people as well as IT people um, you know so you make sure that everybody's considering all aspects of it um, you know we had a project in uh, the Medical College of Georgia um, I think it was the emergency room was wanting to do a demonstration to um, uh, nursing homes to try to you know, cut down on transfers of patients from nursing homes, and they had significant firewall issues, and you know they that had not been really anticipated, looked at, and addressed at the front end, and you know that really is something that you know IT people you know should have thoroughly checked out and given people advice about you know what you can do and not do with those kind of things, because um, that's you know going to make life very difficult. You want to have a quality service so it has to work so those are considerations yeah. you know if it's just you know if you're just a private practice um, you know it's the it's up to you I mean, <laughs> you know but then you'd have to deal with the originating site and all the folks there but mm -hmm. uh, certainly you want buy-in from the institution if it's an institutional site so they commit resources um, and you know would have staff for you um, because, you know, if they don't provide the staff to be the people doing the intake, doing the uh, presenting of the patient and that sort of stuff, uh, or if it's not consistent, the, the quality of the service will not be good. And uh, right. <clears throat> you have to have to be selling, you know, the originating site, what the value to them is, and then you have to show it to them, which is why you want to do all those uh, follow-up uh, things that I described. Mm -hmm. All right, and as we sort of get near the end here, um, do you have one sort of biggest take-home must-do for any person who's looking to start or improve their financial approach to telegenetics? Um, just plan carefully. You know, I outlined the things, the, the thought processes to look at and go through that. And, um, you know, if it's... Be conservative in your financial um, modeling. You know, don't don't over um, don't be overly optimistic about uh, you know your collection rate and those kind of things. You have to figure out you know how it would work best uh, bef before you get into it. But mm -hmm. conversely, if you get into it and it's not financially viable, you have to figure out how you're going to end the service 
And if it's a contract, that's, you know, up to lawyers. Um, you know, if it's not a contract, but some other model, you have to see, you know, what, what the parties have to do in order to say this isn't working and we're going to stop it. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, Dr. Flannery, thank you so much for your time today. It was uh, really helpful to our group as we think about creating business models and making our programs financially viable. Um, as a record, as a reminder to everyone, the recorded webinar, the slides, and the meeting notes will be posted in Basecamp. Uh, the next webinar will be coming in either March or April on technology options. And please also remember to think about uh, the funding for that telehealth meeting in April if you're interested. Uh, feel free to contact me with any questions, and Dr. Flannery generously shared his email here, too. Um, and we thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. Do I do anything to end the webinar? <laughs>